but slightly past one. So let's get the program started while more people trickle in. My name is Shou Di Zeng um, in Mandarin Zhang Shou De, and I am the Education and Programs Coordinator at the Chinese Historical Society of America. Uh, thank you all for joining the program today, The Living Legacy of the Chinese Exclusion Act, a special conversation with Jonathan Alroy. Now, before we get started, just a few tech things. Please keep off your camera and microphone unless otherwise instructed. You can also improve your viewing experience by going to settings and clicking hide non-video participants. If you have any questions for Jonathan, please send it to CHSA Q&A, Kimberly, and we will get around to it at the latter portion of our program. Lastly, please feel free to engage with your fellow guests throughout the program, but please do keep your comments and questions positive in nature and remain respectful of all those joining today. A special thank you to the CHSA's behind the scenes support team of Angelo, Kimberly, and Kevin. Throughout the past few months, CHSA has been hosting programs and dedicating its activities to amplifying Chinese American voices, stories, and condemning anti-Asian American hate, which brings us to the program today. And it is so wonderful to be sharing this virtual space with everyone as we come together to learn about the legacy of the Chinese Exclusion Act and how the same social and judicial mechanisms are still used to justify identity gatekeeping and exclusionary immigration practices to this day. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Jonathan, Jonathan Aldoy. Jonathan is a master's student in international relations at Harvard University and holds an MBA from the University of Michigan. He is an inclusive and innovative financial services leader who worked for three Fortune 5 100 firms, two companies listed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and one company in the NASDAQ 100. He currently resides with his family in Connecticut. Welcome, Jonathan. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. I will now hand this program over to you. Thank you much, very much, Sean. I really appreciate you being giving me the opportunity to be here today. And a big thank you to CHSA and all of you who have turned out. Uh, we're going to be talking for the next 40 minutes or so about the living legacy of the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 21st century. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Why don't we go to the next slide? So a couple disclaimers that are important for me to note at the beginning of our conversation. One is that I'm speaking only for myself. I'm not speaking on behalf of CHSA, of Harvard University, of any employers or any other entity other than myself. The second is that it's important to remember that academia is about inquiry as much as answers. It's important that we ask the questions. What answers we arrive at may depend on a range of factors. I encourage all of you to consider your own research and how you may come to arrive at your own conclusions. What I'm presenting today is what I've concluded, uh, which may be different than others. Rather than footnoting individual items in my slides, I've added my bibliography at the end. It's very important in academia that we give credit to those that came before and what they have learned and shared with us and give them the credit where it's due. So I've listed my sources, happy to address any of them in particular. We'd like to give a very special thanks to Dr. Ayers Manella at Harvard University, Catherine Biondo at the Harvard Law Library, uh, Jesus Solis, who's on the line today, who's my teaching fellow at Harvard University, and the team at CHSA. And a quick content warning, we are going to be discussing bigoted sentiments today, we're going to be discussing hate speech, and so I just want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. We can go to the next slide. So as Sho mentioned at the beginning of our program, we have seen over the last year a very disturbing rise in anti-Asian violence in America. Uh, the numbers from Cal State San Bernardino show that in the last year in 2020, we saw a negative 7% drop in hate crimes in America. A lot of that attributable to the social distancing and lockdowns that occurred during COVID. But at the same time, we saw a positive 149% increase in violence and hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans. And this is certainly not something that should be acceptable to any of us, uh, but it's important to recognize, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, that that didn't come out of nowhere. It was certainly 
fomented and exacerbated by the prior administration and their fascist followers, uh, but it tapped into a fertile and receptive history of anti-Asian sentiment that has existed in America for as long as America has existed. And so we're going to be discussing some of the antecedents of that and how what we've been seeing today in immigration policy in America stems from activities that occurred in the 18th and 19th centuries, as well as now in the 20th and 21st centuries. So we can go ahead to the next slide, please. So this is where we're gonna spend a little more time uh, together and not just run through the slides. So America as an entity is roughly 240 odd years old, 250 years old, but there's a real duality that has existed since our founding. There is a duality in the mythology of America as the land of immigrants, as the great melting pot, the Statue of Liberty, the arms wide open. But yet, there's also the original sin of slavery. There is the absolute legacy of discrimination against people based on ethnic origin, on race, on gender, on religion. Uh, there was a proactive campaign of genocide against Native Americans. Uh, these things cannot be ignored. They cannot fully be squared. There is no satisfactory explanation that gives us, we the people, all men are created equal, and all of the exclusions to what that means. If you were a woman, you did not have rights. We continue to battle for those rights to women's autonomy today. If you were a slave, you did not have rights. If you were indentured, you did not have rights. There were religious tests in America for voting. If you did not own property, you were not able to vote in most of America, both in colonial times and after the Constitution was passed. Uh, if you were a Native American, it was called out in the Constitution that you did not count. If you were poor and if you were non-white. So there is this duality that has existed for as long as America has. And what we're going to see as we discuss it is that a lot of this sentiment of anti-foreigner and anti-immigrant uh, violence has been directed especially at people of Chinese and Japanese and other Asian origins. So we're going to go to the next slide. And what we're talking about in particular is a academic concept, sociological concept and construct known as othering. So this is a gatekeeping ideology. This is around defining who is in the in-group and who is in the out-group, who belongs versus who is undesirable and thus excludable. If you do not belong to the in-group, then you are not afforded the rights and privileges of membership in that group. And so this dehumanization that occurs is a process of setting people as both different from you, but also less than you. So we end up with things like racism and misogyny and homophobia. We see religious persecution, ethnic hatred and criminalization. We see this in America and we see this around the world. And it compounds when we get to things like intersectionality, which is the idea of you are the sum total of all the different factors that you represent. And so you are not only a person of a particular gender, but maybe you are also of a particular ethnicity, of a particular race, of a particular ethnic origin, uh, of a particular religion, and you have all of these identities that intersect with each other. And so when we talk about the rise in anti-Asian violence that we've seen in 2020, for example, it's important to call out the intersectionality that the majority of those events, some 65% of those hate crimes were directed against women. And some of the most violent events, including the shootings in Atlanta, were directed against women. So gender plays a very, very powerful role. And it's important to call that out when we talk about othering. Asian immigrants have been uniquely singled out in American history as non-whites. 
So certainly we talk about the original sin of slavery. America was founded and rooted in racism as much as anything else. And there's that dichotomy of we the people, all men are created equal, and the original sin of slavery. You know, the Bill of Rights is rightly lauded as one of the magnificent achievements in human history with the Magna Carta and other foundational documents that create rights for humanity. The Bill of Rights fully is justified in standing among them. But we have to also remember they are in fact amendments, the, were the 10 first amendments to the Constitution. There were delegates to the Constitutional Convention who chose not to sign the Constitution because it did not include the Bill of Rights, but it did include slavery, and it did exclude Native Americans, and it did exclude women. Asian immigrants in particular have been uniquely singled out as non-whites who are unassimilable aliens, unfit for membership in the nation. And this has taken the form of both public sentiment and legal precedent. And we're gonna be talking about that as we go through our slides today. But the legal exclusion of Chinese in particular through the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s really set the precedent and the administrative foundation for how America runs its immigration process today. Continuing in the 21st century, we see call outs and we see what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Chinese Exclusion cases, the legal cases that challenged it, that established racial and ethnic discrimination as an acceptable and indeed a defining feature that permeates American immigration policy, apparatus, the structures, the bureaucracy, the enforcement. And what we'll talk about is that many of the things we take for granted today, whether it's about profiling at immigration ports, whether it's the fact that we have an immigration and naturaliz naturalization service, concepts like green cards, passports, visas, deportation, all of these things were rooted in the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was, in fact, one of the most impactful laws ever passed in America. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, don't worry, I am not going to read this entire slide to you. I'm not even going to try and go through and explain all of it uh, block by block, because that would take us far more time than we have here. And also, it's important to call out with all the participants that we have on the line, there are surely people who are far more immersed than I am in the depth and details of all of these different acts. And I would not presume to be the font of all wisdom there. Uh, but what we do see is a pattern. So if we we go back to the 1700s and the founding of America with the US Constitution in 1789. Some of the very first acts that were passed actually dealt with who can be a citizen and who is allowed to enter the country. And in fact, the 1790 Naturalization Act, which I believe is still in effect, has been amended over the years said you could be a citizen of the new country of America as long as you were white, but not otherwise. The Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, very, very famous. The Alien Enemies Act, in fact, remains valid some 240 years later. The Sedition Acts were repealed. The Alien Acts weren't. And so we start with exclusion. The Constitution is a paragon of both inclusion and exclusion. And then in the 19th century, there was a great deal of economic pressure as the country grew. And in the 1840s and the 1850s, there's a great deal of influx of Chinese immigrants in particular, less so Japanese, but also Japanese immigrants, but a huge influx of Chinese immigrants into the United States for labor purposes. And they had families when they could, uh, they established communities, found like-minded people, but they were still outsiders. They were treated as outsiders. And when economic fortunes changed, when the transcontinental railroad was completed, when the gold rush started to peter out, all of a sudden there was the surplus, perceived surplus of labor that was undesirable. And it goes back to this racial quality of this is the land for whites and these foreigners, I will avoid using some of the derogatory slurs that were very common in newspapers and other public pronouncements of the day, politicians, uh, but the way that they referred to people of Asian descent. 
uh, they were not desired. So there's a great deal of public sentiment and there's always been this interplay of does public sentiment drive what politicians want? Does politicians capitalize on the public sentiment to pass laws that they think will benefit themselves and aggregate power? It's a constant interplay that we still see in the 21st century, you know, with any political party, uh, you know, reading the tea leaves, looking at polls, what have you. But so there's a great deal of public sentiment and there was a great deal of economic pressure, especially in the Western states that was unfortunately anti-Asian. And this culminated with the passage, and we'll talk about it in a bit, of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that was challenged in court with the Chinese exclusion cases. Uh, there were treaties that were signed with China, uh, which were superseded or actually violated by the Chinese Exclusion Act, by the Scott Act, and by other acts. Um, and the courts had to rule on the legality of these different laws and of these different treaties. You know, there's national law in America, there's also international law that we're dealing with here. So we have laws and acts that the government was passing, that Congress was passing, giving various powers to the executive branch, to the president to enforce. There were cases, there were law cases, challenging these acts uh, that came up through the court system, ultimately arriving from state courts to the Supreme Court. And there were treaties and executive orders that were signed over the years. So we talked about the 1700s and the 1800s. And then we get into the 1900s. And by the 1920s, 1930s, we actually saw a great deal of racial based prohibitions on immigration. There were very active, explicit conversations in Congress, in the states, as to which races, with et which ethnicities were acceptable to come into America and were considered people worthy and desirable of being Americans. And there were racial profiles around whether you were from Central Europe or Northern Europe or Eastern Europe or Southern Europe, whether you were from South and Central America, whether you were from different parts of Asia, from Africa. This is long after slavery had passed, long after we were into the realm of the very proactive negative realm of uh, Jim Crow. But we had these very racially driven, ethnically driven immigration laws that were passed in the 1900s. And they governed who could enter, but not just who could enter and who could become a citizen, but what could those people do? So for example, in Washington state and in California, we saw the alien land laws in the 1913-1914 timeframe, pre-World War I, that actually precluded ownership of land based on ethnicity. And I remember doing an interview with somebody for this paper, and he was sharing, he was a member of CHSA, and he was sharing that his family lives in a community south of San Francisco. And that particular neighborhood is overwhelmingly ethnic Chinese. And it's, this, it's, it's like a, a curve of, of neighborhood. And he said, the reason why is because there were laws prohibiting Asian ownership of land and of houses. But a particular developer built these houses and was willing to sell to Chinese Americans. And so that's where the families were able to buy land and that's where they had their houses and that's where they lived. So, you know, the, the rules around zoning in America and immigration policy is still very ethnically driven and you can see that in the patterns of dispersal of where people live today it's certainly true with african americans and you look at which which counties in america had higher populations of african americans in the 1800s and in the 1900s how that migration has changed and where those folks live today and the implications for voting patterns and other things so we're in the 1900s, we've seen these immigration laws, we've seen these land laws, we've seen various immigration acts, and we've also seen additional court cases. I imagine many people on the phone here are very familiar with the Korematsu cases uh, about Japanese American internment during World War II. And there were executive orders that governed immigration passed down by the president. And then we get into the 2000s, 
we continue to see in a post 9-11 world, a capitalization of American bureaucracy, immigration bureaucracy, now turning from anti-Asian or anti-Black to anti-Arab, anti-Muslim in the wake of 9-11. And this, of course, culminated with just the tragedy of the last four years with the prior administration, with the Muslim ban, with the way refugees were treated, with the wall, uh, with the attempt to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census, uh, with Guantanamo Bay, an extraordinary rendition. What we're going to be talking about in a minute is how we can trace the living legacy of those current actions in the 21st century from the Chinese Exclusion Act, from the Chinese Exclusion case. So we're going to go ahead and move to the next slide. So 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act passed, and it was, a, it was actually not a terribly long law. That's the law right there. You can see the image of it. Uh, so it was about two pages that was signed. It wasn't a 500-page bill, two pages. But one of the key things it said is, it shall not be lawful for any Chinese laborer to come or having so come after the expiration of said 90 days to remain within the United States. So this was the first United States law that excluded a specific racial group from immigration. And it set the stage for the race-based immigration laws that we continue to have today. One of the foundational breakpoints of the Chinese Exclusion Act from a legal standpoint that changed how American law worked post the Chinese Exclusion Act from the way it worked prior is that the CEA defined the existence of people who were aliens, who were not subject to or protected by the Constitution. So it established for the first time, there were classes of people who were intrinsically undesirable in America based on race, in this case, on ethnicity in particular, people who were of Chinese origin. That did not happen before now again. We certainly had issues with African Americans and with slavery. We certainly had issues with the way American government interacted with Native American tribes. So we're not trying to do whataboutism. We're not trying to set one against the other. It's important to recognize the totality of American behavior. But certainly the Chinese Exclusion Act was unique in excluding a specific racial group from immigrating voluntarily into the United States. So that was a really big deal. That changed the way American law worked. And so we can go to the next slide here. And we can talk through what are some of the legacies of the Chinese Exclusion Act that are still in effect. And after we talk about these, we're gonna talk about some of the legal side and the judicial branch of the Chinese Exclusion cases. But when we talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act, academic scholars have identified that the Chinese Exclusion Act has really driven four key things in addition to that sense of legal othering that we talked about at the beginning. So there could be public sentiment and cultural dynamics there. But it's different to say, I or my neighbors may not like somebody to, I now have a legal framework to exclude you, to persecute you. And that's what the Chinese Exclusion Act created, was a legal framework to manage immigration in a way that hadn't been done before. So when we think about things like the Immigration and Naturalization Service, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, Border Patrol. That all began ultimately with the authorizations from the Chinese Exclusion Act, which authorized an Immigration Inspection Service. So all of a sudden, America had to hire people and create an administrative bureaucracy that didn't exist to screen entrance, to weed out and prohibit people who were Chinese from coming in. We didn't have that before, that was new. And they had to invent the processes 
of how they were going to go about doing that. They had to invent the record keeping. They had to find ways to identify people. They had to find interrogative mechanisms. How do we know that you are who you say you are? And ultimately what we have today, Immigration and Customs Enforcement or ICE, everybody can have their own opinion on the familiarity of ICE with Gestapo or the Stasi. Um, but the fact is we have ICE and it stems from the Chinese Exclusion Act. So America had to begin identifying and recording the movements of these people, the occupations, the relationships. They had to take pictures of them. They had to know who these people were. And these were immigrants, they were returning residents, people who had left and come back. Are you in fact a native born citizen? Did you have birthright citizenship? And over time, those permission papers evolved into what became green cards, passports, visas. This is where they came from. They didn't, they didn't get invented by the Chinese Exclusion Act, but they were an outcome of it. So green cards actually came along later. I think they initially were issued green um, after the 1940s, but the concept of a green card, of a permanent resident card, uh, came, I believe, from uh, Chinese immigrants who were working with the U.S. Army during the Mexican-American War. And then they came back across the border into the U.S. after the war and needed permission to stay. And so the army began issuing cards, permanent residence cards, that evolved into green cards. So this all began, what we think of as passports and visas and green cards, began with the Chinese Exclusion Act. For the first time, it defined immigration as an actual offense that could be enforced criminally. So illegal immigration. Now, I personally believe that you can't define a human being as illegal. I, I don't even understand the philosophical construct but the behavior of being in the country without authorization, that that is a criminal offense, that it is illegal for you to be here, that came from the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I believe the Naturalization Act of 1790 is what first gave the government the right to deport people who it deemed as dangerous or suspicious. But certainly the Chinese Exclusion Act strengthened and formalized the expulsion rights of the government. And so we have the ability for the government to deport people. So these things, ICE, green cards, passports, criminal enforcement of illegal immigration, deportation, these are all living legacies that exist in 21st century America that stemmed from the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So we'll go ahead and turn to the next slide. So now we're going to shift from talking about policy a little bit and talking about some of the administrative mechanisms of the Chinese Exclusion Act and what that led to, to talking about legal doctrine. And this is certainly where the Harvard Law Library helped me understand this. And the concepts of precedent. So there's a concept called stare decisis in America's legal world, which is that we should listen to precedent. If a court has already decided something on any given case, that decision remains what is considered good law. You can cite it and say, because this prior court said this answer, we are going to continue to follow that as a precedent until and unless that particular court decision is overturned. And it's explicit that it is not based on the underlying act. So in this case, there was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. That was repealed 60 years later in 1942 by the Magnuson Act. So the Chinese Exclusion Act does not exist today as law. But in 1889, a gentleman named Che Shan Ping, who lived in the United States for 12 years, got permission, we talked about these resident cards, got permission, legal permission to visit his family in China. So he went back from the United States to China, visited his family. He was on the boat back to the United States. Right before he returned, a couple days before his boat landed, the Scott Act of 1888 went into effect. Now, Xi Jinping had gotten permission under the auspices of what is called the Berlin Game Treaty, which was a legal treaty signed between the government of the United States and the government of China. The Scott Act 
violated the Berlin Game Treaty. The Scott Act said you may not enter. The Berlin Game Treaty said that people have the right of travel. So there was a, there was a conflict between these two laws. So he sued. He sued in court and it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that yes, the Scott Act, the statute, did conflict with the treaty. That is correct. Yes, the two are in conflict, but the law was still going to be enforced and he could not stay. He could not enter. And it's important to note that that precedent of what we call the Ping case or the Chinese exclusion case remains valid as legal precedent today in 2021. Ping has not been overturned. It's not commonly referred to directly, but it exists. And so what we're going to do now on the next slide, if we can turn to the next slide, is see how that legacy continues. And so uh, Mr. Robert Chang at the Korematsu Center at Seattle University School of Law it did a lot of work on this. And I find this you know, fairly extraordinary. So here, looking at the left, we see the Chinese exclusion case, Shei Shan Ping versus United States in 1889. And this text that's here is from the judge's ruling. The power of exclusion of foreigners is an incident of sovereignty that cannot be granted away or restrained on behalf of anyone. So the court is finding that the government of the United States has an intrinsic sovereign ability to govern who is allowed to be in the country. That was the finding. And that this cannot be granted away or restrained. You cannot, the, the court does not have the power to tell the government what to do in the area of immigration. So now we jump ahead to 1953. There's another immigration case, post-World War II, Shaughnessy versus United States, X. Rail Mezzi. So now the court is citing Ping as a precedent. Courts have long recognized the power to expel or exclude aliens as a fundamental sovereign attributes exercised by the government's political department, so that is the executive branch and the legislative branch. This is immune from judicial control. Now, many of you on the call may be familiar with the very famous case of Marbury versus Madison, which established the principle of judicial review. It made the court, the judiciary, an equal branch of government, a co-equal branch of government with the legislative and executive branches in America. And it did so by saying that courts, in fact, do have the right to review all laws passed in America and rule on whether those laws are constitutional or not. So what's happening here is the court is actually giving away some of its own power and saying, we do not have the right to review immigration law. That is outside of the purview of the courts because it is a, they called it a fundamental sovereign attribute of the government. So now in 1977, Fialo versus Bell, they're citing Mezzi. So they're not citing Ping directly, but they're citing Mezzi. With that same language, the Supreme Court has long recognized that power to exclude aliens is a fundamental sovereign attribute immune from judicial control. So they're literally quoting the language and saying, we are ruling in this case based on the precedent that traces to the Chinese exclusion case, which was itself a challenge to the Scott Act and Chinese Exclusion Act. So now jump ahead from 1977 to 2018. We have a corrupt and fascist administration in control in America, and it hates Muslims. So it passes a Muslim ban. It was an executive order that's challenged in court. Muslim ban version one, struck down. Muslim ban version two, struck down. Muslim ban version three. Now the government, I think they removed Chad from the list. They removed a majority Muslim country. 
and they added a country that was uh, not majority Muslim. And they said, we're coming back to the Supreme Court, you know, somebody challenged us, but we're going to defend this Muslim ban on the principle that by changing what countries are included and excluded from the Muslim ban, we are exercising that sovereign right of the executive powers of the government to decide who can enter and exit the country. And that was upheld. So the Supreme Court validated that Muslim ban, version three. And they cited Fiala, which cited Mezzi, which cited Ping. So it's incredible that you can see across 150 years, going from 1889 to 2018, these precedents have carried forward. And so now we can go to the next slide here. And there were two extraordinary legal doctrines which came out of the Ping case. Again, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion case were probably two of the most impactful laws and judicial decisions ever passed in America. Because these two legal doctrines, and we talked about precedent and stare decisis, but that's kind of a philosophy. But these were actually legal doctrines that govern power relationships in the government. The doctrine of plenary power or non-consular, consular non-reviewability says that the courts will not intervene on questions of national security, territorial sovereignty, and self-preservation because the executive branch has the prerogative. So these are non-reviewable by the courts. You cannot challenge these decisions in court. You do not have standing. These are outside our purview. And this is the court saying this about itself. This isn't Congress restraining the court's ability to make these decisions. This is the court saying we choose not to be involved here. We think we do not have power here. And the second was national security exceptionalism, which is about secrecy. When the executive branch claims national security is at stake, the courts will not question that judgment. So the government comes in continuing today in the 2010s, 2020s, the government goes in, this is a case around uh, the torture cases and you know extraordinary rendition, Guantanamo Bay, the Iraq war, all of this stuff. The government comes in and says, we are not going to tell you, the court, why this is secret, we're just going to tell you that it is secret. And the court says, okay, we're not even, we're not going to even judge the merits of the case because we do not have the power to even review it. And so the outcome of that, the output of that, is that the action by a consular official by a visa official, by an immigration official, by an immigration judge, by an administrator, by, an administrator, by uh, somebody who's hired in the executive branch. Not necessarily, they could be appointed, they could be hired, not necessarily an elected official, but even by an elected official, even by the president. They are using powers expressly conferred by Congress. So those are not subject to judicial review because the actions themselves are due process. You can't get additional due process because the very act that they took on your visa petition or your asylum petition is in itself considered due process of law. And if the government says, I'm not going to tell you why I'm holding you in Guantanamo Bay, the court says, okay, we're not going to question that you've said this is a national security issue. So what are some of the outcomes of that that we've seen from these plenary power and national security exceptionalism doctrines? Well, we've seen things like the Japanese American internment during World War II in the Korematsu case. We see the Muslim ban. We see the policy of family separation. We see literal children as defendants in immigration courts. We see the refusal of the government to provide counsel, legal counsel, or even translators to the accused. We require asylum seekers to stay outside of the country which is a violation, all of these are violations of international law, doesn't matter. They, a lot of these are violations of American law, doesn't matter. Immigration, plenary power doctrine, outside the purview. It is a fundamental sovereign attribute of the government's right to control who can enter and under what conditions. Extraordinary rendition, 
Guantanamo Bay. We've talked about that. And then in the end of 2020, the attempt by the former administration, they sued to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census. And they based that on the principle from the Chinese Exclusion Act that being in the country without authorization is a crime. 1882, 2020. Now the court, very interestingly, never ruled on the merits of the census case. They vacated the decision because it was no longer right. The new administration took over. The new administration obviously is humane, unlike the past administration, but the court itself never actually ruled about the merits of the prior administration's argument that they can exclude certain people from being counted in the census. Then going back to these power doctrines. So we're going to go to the next slide here. And this is going to be my last slide that I share with you. And then I'm happy to take your questions. So my conclusion based on the research I've done, and as I said, academia is about inquiry. It's about asking questions. What conclusions or answers we arrive at may be different, but as long as we ground them in truth and in fact, it's okay to arrive at different conclusions. But we do pursue truth in what we do. So I believe we must recognize and remember that the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Cases, were crucial foundations that formalized America's legal framework and mechanisms for racial and ethnic discrimination in the realm and of immigration. All out. Turning anti-immigrant sentiment into barriers to entry, barriers to citizenship, to housing, to employment, to court access. These carved out exceptions to the Constitution and established doctrines that preclude the courts from reviewing the merits of cases that deal with immigration and national security. They're outside the purview of the courts. And we talked about that notion of, of othering or setting cultural perceptions of who can be American, who should be excluded, and how the gates should be guarded against undesirable outsiders. So this interplay between anti-Asian public sentiment and government policy, and this has happened across party lines. This isn't about one party yes, one party no. This has happened from the 1700s to the 2000s. And we see this twists and turns of executive orders of government fiat. This administration does terrible things. This administration does good things. But to me, that demonstrates the capricious lack of norms that we're facing. There isn't a mechanism for humanitarian control because the courts have ruled that we're not going to get involved. Now, we do have in a very positive way, and I want to end on a positive note. We do have the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. It was signed into law on May 20th. That's a great thing. We're gonna get some attention on this at the federal level. We're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get action and, and that is crucial to have. But it's important to know where we are didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, it came from a long history that we can document and we can trace. And with that, I am glad to answer any questions that you may have, thank you. Wow, that was that was rich. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation. I um, I really love the deep dive and how you really carried us across time with your words and the slides to see the intersectionality of how the Chinese American community, uh, the Japanese American communities, Muslim communities, and so many more communities and individuals have all been at the heel of this national security exceptionalist doctrine in our society. Um, um, and dating all the way back to the colonial era and how the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 really laid down a crucial brick in the foundation of our society today. And it was mind blowing to know that even just two pages, just two pages of paper, those in position of power back in 1882 were able to change the lives of so many people and, uh, and pave the way to um, our legal system today. And if I may throw in one of my personal favorite quotes, uh, that reminds me a lot about the conversation we brought up about othering, where um, Amin Malou says, for it is often the way we look at other people that imprisons them within their narrows, their own narrowest allegiances. And it is also the way we look at them that may set them free. 
So anyways, let's get the Q&A session rolling. And thank you everyone for the great questions. And um, we'll try to get through as much as we can. So the first question we have comes from William. And William asks, we yellows have also been labeled honorary whites. How do we reconcile being non-white and also honorary white? So the way I would answer that is to say it's still fundamentally is a paradigm that's based on race, that race and ethnicity. It's still centralizing white as the standard to which people should aspire. And so uh, there's the concept of the model minority. Asians are the most white-like. Asians are good at math. Asians are good at science. Asians are good at technology. Uh, Asians are quiet. They're respectful. These are all stereotypes. They're very harmful stereotypes. Uh, they are stereotypes that can wound and hurt, especially when public policy becomes predicated on these assumptions and these stereotypes of human beings who should not be grouped in this way. So when you look at somebody and say, because they are of a particular ethnicity or a particular race or a particular religion, or they come from a particular place or have a particular family structure, and you say, I'm going to center that comparing it to, well, how white are you? That intrinsically creates that sense of othering. And instead of validating you as a human being to say, you have intrinsic worth yourself, and your family and your culture and who you've come from and you know who you are, I'm going to define your worth relative to me. That is very much a sense of othering because I'm choosing whether or not you belong and you get to enter my country based on my assumption of how white like you are. Thank you for your answer. Um, William actually asked another question, um, I think continue on from this conversation. And William asks, congressional debate on exclusion considered Chinese inferior, but some congressmen said Chinese were superior, but we whites still don't want um, a, uh, Chinese people here. Is duality still a matter of othering? Absolutely. And we can see those in contemporary debates that still exist over immigration. If we change the focus or the locus of that from saying uh, Chinese American immigrants to Mexican American or Central American Latin American immigrants and saying we have this dual again, we have this duality of these foreigners are coming in and stealing our jobs. But th that, I mean, that, that's just empirically not true. Right, that's just, that is provably false, but yet that's a perception that guides public policy. Uh, and, and so that is that problem. It doesn't matter whether you're categorizing someone as being superior or inferior, it's still centralizing the discussion on, are you enough like me to justify whether I should include or exclude you from participation in our culture? Yeah, I agree. And um, I feel like this then touches back on your point you mentioned earlier about the, the, to the totality, seeing it when we zoom out a little bit. Um, and thank you everyone for continuing the discussion uh, around this topic in the chat. And I uh, hope you don't mind me bringing up some of the things that's been mentioned there with Jonathan. Um, I really like how um, Wilmer's question has been attached to the model minority myth that these Asian superior arguments feed into the myth. Um, Ralph, do you have anything else to add to this before we move on to the- uh, Not um, at the moment, no. Okay. Uh, Courtney is wondering if these slides will be available to the attendees after. I know this is being recorded, um, but I think she's maybe more wondering if the slides will be available. I would defer to CHSA on that, how you run your programs. Okay, well, if that's okay with you, we can go ahead and uh, forward the article presentation um, to the attendees. Um, Warren here is asking um, if you could address the last bullet point in the last slide of your presentation. Um, it's about uh, the COVID-19 Hate Crime Act. Uh, is there a particular question about the, about the act? Um, no, Warren is just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about and maybe elaborate on the point a little bit. 
Sure. Well, so there, there, you know, it's important to note that such an act exists now uh, where it didn't before. And so I'm going to bring up the act here. So uh, COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act passed by the 117th Congress became law on May 20th, 2021. Uh, the initial kind of framing or introduction of the law talks about the spread of COVID-19 in 2020, the dramatic increase in hate crimes and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. It shares some of the statistics that we've discussed uh, that uh, it is attacking, there, there are people who are attacking people of Asian American and Pacific Islander descent, and in particular, uh, women. We talked about the intersectionality and violence against women and how this is disproportionately affecting them. So the Attorney General, as part of this law, is directed at the Department of Justice to facilitate the expedited review of hate crimes report crimes to federal, state, local, or tribal enforcement agencies, uh, establish online reportings, do a data aggregation, uh, expand public education campaign aimed at raising awareness of hate crimes and reaching victims. Um, so there, there are a variety, this is, this is actually a much longer law. Uh, it's multiple pages beyond what the Chinese Exclusion Act was. So it's amazing how Something that can be very, very short can have such an outsized impact in American life over centuries. Uh, so that is what the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act is doing. And then there's a long section of definitions. What is a hate crime? What is an agency? Uh, what are units of local government? And so we talked during my presentation about this concept of administrative bureaucracy and not i'm not using bureaucracy in a negative way but that's literally what it's called the mechanisms the processes the structures that the government has to take action and how in terms of immigration those structures were created as an outgrowth of the law that was passed with the chinese exclusion act in order to implement it if Congress says we are not going to let people of Chinese descent into the United States, we need to have procedural mechanisms to identify and exclude those people. So one of those other outcomes of something like that is you have laws that seem like they're going to be very straightforward, but you have pages and pages of definition of the administrative structure. Because it goes back to how are you going to implement this thing? How are you going to make it? So you have to define it seems a little odd to think, does Congress not know? Does anybody not know what a local government is? Does anybody not know what a hate crime is, what a law enforcement agency is? But each law that we pass sets up its own definitions of these parameters. And then, so it sets up the definition and then it tells them what to do. And so in my uh, presentation, the last slide, which we don't need to go to, but the last slide is a bibliography and it includes a link to the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act itself, to the text of that, uh, so that you can read it at the Library of Congress. That would be a great resource to have and to share. Um, so continue on the topic of action, Emma is wondering, what do you think about the hate crime bill? Does it do anything except give police more power to determine what is or what is not hate crime? Great question. You talk about intersectionality. You know, talk about what is the correct role of law enforcement in America? What is the correct role of reporting? Uh, that, that is a fraught topic to be sure. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. So I will say that in my opinion, again, speaking only for myself, not trying to represent anyone else, um, I think it is a positive thing to collect and make public data on what is happening. It's a cliche to say you can't manage what you can't measure, but there is still truth to that. If we do not know that there are hate crimes occurring and we do not know their frequency and we do not know who they're targeting, then we are not able to put prevention efforts into effect. If we do not know, for example, that these crimes are disproportionately affecting women, then our responses may not reach the people who need it most. Um, I think it's also a cliche to say that no matter what law is passed, you could always do more. 
there's always more you can do. We are in a very delicate situation in our democracy right now, where we have, again, I'm just opining for myself, where we have one set of people in government who are interested in having policy debates about what is the role of government, uh, what policies are appropriate, who should we be helping and how, how much money should we be spending. And there is another party whose sole purpose is to say, no, we don't actually like having government at all. We want to put all control in the hands of the supreme leader and have a theocracy. It's very difficult to have bipartisanship and discuss tax policy when your partners who maybe are on the other side of the aisle actively want you dead. I mean, that's, and it sounds hyperbolic, except that it's real. And that's kind of what we're facing. So getting any law passed through Congress right now and signed by the president is a huge accomplishment, especially anything dealing with topics like ethnicity, race, immigration, things that have a disproportionately outsized political effect. Thank you for your answer. And on intersectionality and allyship, William commented, uh, I don't like how, this quote unquote, um, I don't like how our, our achievements are used to put down black people, but I know some, some Chinese Americans don't like white people labels. Uh, they don't like um, the labels oppressors and people of color as the oppressed. And William is asking, how do we bring our own people together? So, so that, that is an excellent point, is an excellent question. That is where I think I, as somebody who is not of Asian American descent and not of African American descent, need to step back from that conversation and say, I'm not necessarily the right person to answer that question. But that it is an excellent question I think multiple communities should uh, engage in, and I'm certainly happy to participate in the discussion, but I don't think I'm necessarily the right person to answer that. And I would refer to CHSA, for example, as a, as a venue to have those conversations. Yeah, thank you. I think um, in this era, it's important um, for us all to engage with these conversations, maybe in our own ways and reflect on our own positionality uh, in the identities that we, uh, that we take on. Um, I have a question for you, Jonathan, if you don't mind me asking. It's a question on inspiration. Um, I think anyone would be impressed by your resume of achievements um, in the financial service industry. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what inspired you to pivot to a study in international relations. Uh, anger, really. You know, if, I, if I'm going to answer your question honestly, um, I didn't include the, the picture in my slides today, but I have a great picture of my son when he was I guess, about five or six years old. And uh, my wife was abroad and she was flying back into the country. And so we were going to go to the airport and pick her up. And it was just very coincidental, but she happened to be flying back the day of the Muslim ban, the day the first Muslim ban was passed. And uh, at the time I lived in San Francisco and there was a very appropriate uproar like I've never seen. And there were hundreds of people, including me, who went to the airport. And there were people, there were lawyers who went to the airport uh, knowing that people were gonna be pulled off planes without recourse to counsel, without access to counsel. Again, exactly what we talked about. These decisions are non-reviewable. If an immigration official pulls you off a plane and says, you may not enter, you have no recourse. You can't claim habeas corpus. You can't go to the courts. You, you, it's simply unreviewable. So this is, again, real stuff in the 20 teens. So we, we went down to the airport um, because we were picking up my wife. And we made signs that said, uh, you know, no ban, no wall, love is love, no Muslim ban. And you know, we were standing there cheering people coming off the planes along with everyone else. And I realized that the only way for me to get through the next four years of this administration would be to find a way to channel what I was feeling into some kind of positive action. So I got very involved with ACLU. One of the things is I came to Harvard to study international relations, study national security, and study the link between democracy and despotism. 
to say, how can I have a role? And also, frankly, to channel some of that anger maybe into academic papers, which was a healthier way of expressing it. Wow. So I can be angry in a PowerPoint deck, and that, you know, that's, that's better for the stress level. Thank you for being so candid with your answer. Um, to those in the audience, we are approaching um, the end of the program. So if you have any questions, please um, send them now to Kimberly at CHSA Q&A. And um, Jonathan, I have one other question for you while we wait for any other questions to trickle in. That is, um, in the first slide, you mentioned that academia is about inquiry as much as it is about answers. So moving forward, how do you have any other academic research projects underway or other things that you're interested in that you would like to explore in an academic setting or uh, I guess as an activist? So, so continuing this type of research, right? So my focus in my studies is looking at the links between democracy and despotism. Uh, I think we remain on the cusp. The crisis has not passed. Uh, we, again, we have, again, I'm, I'm trying to avoid being too political, because when we're talking about things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Chinese Exclusion case, and we see that living legacy that has lasted for centuries, and we see that it has transcended domestic politics. We see that regardless of who is in control of the White House or Congress, regardless of what judges are appointed to the Supreme Court, we see a continuing um, legacy of these laws and cases that remain as living precedents today. So uh, I'm trying not to speak necessarily on a political basis here, but I would say in response to your specific question, we have a major American political party, the party of Lincoln, at least in theory, who literally abdicated their own national convention to have a party platform. They had no platform on taxes, they had no platform on immigration. They had no platform on the economy. They had no platform on national security or defense. They had no platform on NASA or the EPA. Literally, their platform was foundationally fascist. Our political party's platform is whatever our dear leader wants. That, that was literally their platform. That is extraordinarily dangerous and unhealthy for our democracy. That is an existential threat. I don't mean to be a downer, but. No, I think the, I uh, thank you for sharing that. I think the struggle for, um, for social justice and uh, indeed continues. It's very true that no one is free until we all are. Um, so let me check if we have any other questions here from the audience. And it looks like that will be it. Um, so if anyone wants to drop one last question before we close, we can go ahead and answer that. Okay. Give it a few moments. All right, folks. Well, it's a little bit past two and I think we'll close here. Thank you uh, again, everyone for coming by and thank you, Jonathan, for being here, sharing the fruits of your research. It was a real honor, and again, uh, my sincere thanks to the Chinese Historical Society of America for giving me this on this opportunity to share with you. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. I certainly have learned a lot, and I really look forward to carrying this newfound uh, perspective into future conversations. So um, our next event will be held on June 26th, Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m., where our guest speaker, John McCormick, who is also with us here in the audience, uh, will be discussing the forgotten Chinese of the Napa Valley. We hope to see you all there. So again, thank you all for joining today and have a good rest of your day. Or if the sun is getting dim where you are, have a good night. Thank you all.